This is the video that you've all been waiting for. My conversion story. Or in actual fact, my life story. So let us start this story from the very beginning. I was born in 1985 in the Republic of South Africa. I was born to a very religious Christian mother. My father at that time was not really very religious. Um, when I was born, I had a lot of medical issues. Um, I had big issues, uh, breathing, um, I had asthma uh, as a child. I actually lived in like a, a glass house filled with oxygen um, for quite a while. Um, until I was able to, to breathe on my own um, in the normal world. Um, at the age of four, I was diagnosed with a very rare heart disease. Um, and um, that is the point where my father became religious. So I was diagnosed with this rare heart disease. I was rushed to hospital. Um, uh, the doctors told my mother um, that she should get my father was working at the time and that we should come to the they should come to the hospital to basically say uh, say goodbye because there is nothing that they can do for me medically anymore um, and it's basically uh, time to go. Um, so my mother, being a very religious Christian um, from a charismatic sect, um, she brought in two uh, duomenes, two priests, um, and they came and uh, they prayed for me, and my mother was there, and my fa father was there. Obviously, I remember nothing of this, so I'm just telling it to you as my mother has told it to me many times. Um, so she said I was lying there, there was machines everywhere, you know, with the ECG, with a heartbeat going up and down, up and down, and then basically I flatlined, um, which means technically that I was clinically dead. Um, and my mother said they prayed, and as these duomenes slash priests said, Amen, I came back to life the ECG came back up and the doctors still this day don't know what exactly happened they don't think it's medically possible but Baruch Hashem I was cured no heart disease ever since um, so that was at the age of four when I was six years old um, I was running in a field I was quite a very I was a very active child um, and I came back with like a bump on my left foot, on my left lower foot, uh, just above the Maliwellis, for those that is medically trained, like me. Um, and my mother obviously being very health conscious and concerned with my whole history, told my father that I should go straight to the doctor. My father said, look, he's a boy, he's active. He was running in the field in a, in a competition. He probably bumped himself or something bit him. Um, you know, it is Africa after all. Um, so don't uh, be too concerned. My mother said she kept on telling my father, no, we got to take him to the doctor. After two weeks, my father gave up with my mother, told her, just take him to the doctor if you feel uh, there's something wrong. The doctor didn't think that there's anything major wrong, but uh, said that he would um, he would cut this out, the cyst out. He believed it was a cyst at the time, and he will send it to Tigerberg Hospital, which is a big national hospital here in Cape Town, South Africa, and they will analyze it, and they will see exactly uh, what's wrong. So uh, a few weeks later. The test results came back from this uh, biopsy and they found that it was a, a cancerous, um, a very aggressive cancer uh, called Ewing sarcoma. 
It's a cancer that attacks mainly long bones, so your humerus, your femur, your thigh bone, uh, your tibia, your lower leg bone, which in my case was the case, or the sternum, which is the bone that sits here. Um, so I immediately started chemotherapy at Tigerberg Hospital in Cape Town. We were living in uh, George at the time. Um, and um, that meant a lot of visits to Cape Town. Um, every three weeks I had to come for a week and they would put me on a drip uh, to give me the chemo. I lost all my hair. Um, I threw up practically daily. Um, that's pretty much cancer for you. It's, uh, it's not for sissies. Um, and then after a year, at the age of seven, the doctor said they, they've done all that they could. Um, you know, it's, there is still cancer there. It's not a lot, but it is still there. And they feel that they need to amputate. My mother being very religious, charismatic, and my father being a Protestant Christian, um, felt that they'll give it a last go with uh, more duomenes. Um, and they brought these duomenes and they came and they prayed and everything. And my father asked him to do another test, which is not common, but, uh, you know, giving the heart disease story, they said, okay, and they did it again. It was still cancerous. And they told my uh, father and mother at the time that if they do not amputate soon, this is a very aggressive cancer. The, the chemo obviously held it back, um, but they will have to amputate my leg below the knee as soon as possible. So my father obviously consulted with various other doctors and it was decided that they should go ahead and do the amputation. So at age seven, I was amputated below the knee. I've been an amputee ever since. I was still pretty active, um, I played hockey, I played cricket, I played tennis, um, very active child. Um, and at that time, you know, growing up in a Christian family, I was still going to Sunday school every Sunday, um, learning the Bible, you know, at that time the Bible was the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the way we learned it was um, basically the story starting from the Old Testament or the Torah and then the, uh, the Navim and then the Ketuvim uh, or the prophets and the writings and then the New Testament. So I've always had a big thing uh, about the Bible and about God. I mean, I've always believed there's, there is a God. Um, I didn't really know how to define God, but always believed there was a God. And I had very much a Christian concept of God. You know, a big man with a stick that whacks you when you're naughty and uh, rewards you when you're good. Um, but I've always, even when I was little, uh, my mother uh, tells me this story, that when I was um, six or seven years old, um, I told my mother that, uh, you know, I believe in God, but I have, I have difficulty with a three-in-one concept. That God is one, but also three, but also one. And that there's Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God, but they're actually one. And that Jesus died, but he's also God, but God didn't die. You can understand why as a child and even as an adult, I could not understand that. Um, so many people started calling me uh, Klein Moses or Little Moshe um, because I like the stories of Moshe. Um, I think there's a lot about Moshe that I connect to, you know, being a bit of an outsider, um, having a speech impairment, which is sort of a disability, and I obviously having a proper disability. Um, so I always think I connect it in that way to Moshe. I'm not 100% sure, you know, as a child at the time. Um, and my memory is my mush not good. Uh, so most of this of my younger life is from what my mother told me. Um, so that was basically me growing up. 
as a teenager, I think most people would relate, um, you know, from any religion, uh, really, you know, when you're a teenager, you're starting to, to question things more. You don't just believe what you're told. You're trying to figure out life and the world and everything uh, for yourself. Um, so when I was a teenager, I really struggled with religion. Um, and I didn't like religion at all. I, I thought it was, uh, you know, uh, like a scheme uh, to keep people... Uh, in a certain box and I was at that time very anti the system listen to system over down um, I was uh, in a band you know we played uh, Metallica, Sarin Gas uh, later Seether is a, a famous uh, South African band that also went international um, also obviously a lot of Afrikaans bands that I listened to uh, Putin or Dance, um, Pulisikar, the front of that name is, uh, is a bit too uh, secular for uh, the current crowd. Um, and I, I really moved away from mainstream religion. So I still believe there was like a higher power or something, but um, I was not interested in anything uh, mainstream religion. Um, so I would call me at that time irreligious, basically. Believing in a God, but, uh, but not really defining it. So, I mean, I've Googled it and it's, it's called agnostic. Um, although I've heard there's many different uh, theories about agnostic, but that is more or less what, what I believed when I was in my teenage years. So my mother and father were still very much involved in the church. My father was quite high up in the church. Um, there's now the, the, at that time, we were no longer Protestant, we were Methodist, which is more uh, a modern Christianity, if you want to call it that. Um, and my mother was always, and is still uh, charismatic. So happy, clappy. She's happy and she's clapping uh, with a lot of singing and hallelujah, you know, and the whole thing. Um, and my mother is also a missionary. So she um, goes out into Africa and, you know, converts people to Christianity. Um, I then uh, finished my schooling when I was 18. Um, I got accepted into uh, medical orthotics and prosthetics in Pretoria, which is far away from George. Um, it's about 1,200 kilometers. Um, and got accepted. I went to university in Pretoria. And this is the first time that I've really been away from home where, and I think many people watching this can also relate to this um, in university, you're normally away from your parents, you're just with friends, people your age, um, and that's where you really, you know, make things for yourself, you know, your own ideas, your own thoughts, your own way of life. Um, you're no longer in a, in a closed, protective environment, but you're more out in the world. So when I was in university, I mean, I didn't even open a Bible. Um, it was mostly... A party, a lot of partying. Um, like I've said in some of my other videos, I was mamash secular. Um, so my teenagers already, you know, drinking from the age of 14, um, smoking all sorts of uh, herbal grass, um, really living the proper secular life from a very young age. I hope my mother doesn't see this video. Um, and I continued that in university, you know, proper drinking, more grass being smoked, um, really living a, a proper secular life, you know, with girls and the whole thing. So at the age of 22, I finished my studies. Um, I was actually dating a girl uh, for three years, my longest relationship I've ever been in. Um, 
And when we broke up, it was obviously my first, like, proper, proper girlfriend. Um, so when we broke up, um, just randomly, um, in the university, there was a, a guy from Malaysia, ex-South African, that had a, uh, was running an orthotic and prosthetic uh, clinic in Malaysia, and he was looking for someone. And I was one of the top students um, in university. And I happened to be there. Um, and he told me, would you be interested to come to Malaysia? Now, I've never ever lived or went outside of South Africa. So, um, I was quite keen to travel, uh, but it was also a bit nerve-wracking, you know, leaving everything. I'll be away from my friends. I'll be away from my family. But, you know, I just broke up with my girlfriend. I thought, you know, what a good opportunity uh, to see a bit of the world. And, uh, and I took it with open arms. So in that same year, I uh, went to Malaysia with this guy that I randomly met at university. Um, and I joined Las Corp Holdings, which is a private prosthetics and orthotic practice uh, within Kuala Lumpur University Hospital, for those of you that do know Malaysia. Um, and when I came to Malaysia, you got to remember that I'm uh, a proper South African, I'm Afrikaans, so culturally we are very Christian and we are quite close-minded and we keep to ourselves. So Afrikaans people normally mix only with Afrikaans people. Um, and I have, at that time, um, you know, when I was um, seven, uh, basically, seven to nine, apartheid basically finished. Um, so apartheid was a, is a, was a segregation between whites and non-whites, no matter if they're black or colored or Indian or whatever. Um, so I've never really lived or interacted, you know, properly with um, people from another culture or even another color. Um, obviously in school, I mean, I had friends that was uh, colored, blacks, Indians, um, but... Uh, I've never really lived with them um, or experienced their way of life or their way of belief. So in Malaysia, I had a proper culture shock. So the first family that I stayed with for three months was a Hindu Indian family. Um, and for me, this was a Mamasha eye opener. Um, at that time, you know, I wasn't really associating myself with Christianity, but I mean, I grew up in Christianity. And I believed in a God or a higher power, but I didn't really know how to define him or how to live, um, you know, a godly life or a holy life. Um, so I was in this family and the old lady that was there, I called her old auntie because she was like 80. Um, and I was uh, 22 at the time. And she was a very devout Hindu. I mean, she had a room in a house built for idols there was just idols in the room and every morning at exactly five o'clock she would ring that bell as like a little golden bell and obviously me being quite a curious uh, individual i wanted to know you know what's happening in this room so I, one day i got up the courage i thought you know i'm uh living uh, outside South Africa, my first time with the Indian family, I've never seen Hindus, um, I want to learn about Hinduism. So she had a very nice way of explaining it. Um, she basically said that, that she's not praying to the actual uh, idols. Um, I told her, but it looks like you're praying to the idols. She says, no, the idols is like uh, something to focus on, but they do believe in uh, one central entity. Um, and they're constantly trying to draw closer uh, to, the to this light and uh, to uh, get to Nirvana, um, uh, the ultimate uh, level in their, their belief. Um, they believe the cow is sacred, 
So I'm, I'm a big meat eater. So I couldn't eat meat in that house, which was tricky. And they were full vegetarians. So I managed uh, for three months. Um, and that was basically my first run at Hinduism. So I do have quite a good knowledge of how Hinduism is practiced and what they actually believe and their customs. I went to a Depavali festival. Um, they've got a big statue, um, Batu, Batu Caves, I think it's called. Um, I might pop in a picture of me there on the steps, walked up, I did the whole thing. Because um, I really wanted to immerse myself in all the cultures, you know, this being my first uh, opportunity abroad, well paid. Um, so I took full advantage of it. After um, the three months, I moved in with uh, four um, Buddhist girls, Chinese girls. Um, I moved there because it was closer to work um, and I could eat meat in the house, um, which for me was essential. Um, so there, it was the first time, number one, I'm living with Chinese people. Um, and my first run in with uh, Buddhism. Now Buddhism was for me also quite strange because they do have this big fat guy, Buddha, that they uh, pray to. But they also, the way these girls explained it, and the English was my much not the best, but the way they explained it is similar to what this old auntie explained to me, is that it's uh, they believe in a higher power, like an energy, uh, Zen, uh, no, Tsi, it's called, I probably pronounce it not in the right way, but they were very about this Tsi, and it's an energy, and you know, the things that you do influences this, and basically karma, um, and I didn't really get the whole just of it, because I've discovered in Buddhism there is a lot of different opinions, like in many other religions, but Buddhism Amash is like your own way of life. It doesn't seem to have a set, a uh, fixed rule book uh, to follow, uh, which I found uh, interesting. Um, but both Hinduism and Buddhism didn't really appeal to me. Um, I continued to stay uh, with these uh, four Chinese girls um, until I finished my year in Malaysia. And also being in Malaysia is a, as a dominant Islamic country. They're not that strict. I mean, there's plenty of Westerners um, and a very big party scene. So I was still very secular at the time and it is in Malaysia where I probably partied more in my life than I ever would or could dream of. Um, I was out in clubs maybe four or five times a week, if it was that little. Um, I was drinking my mash all the time. Um, it's quite warm there, humid. So a beer goes down, lovely. Um, and they are, I did find Islam quite in interesting because Islam, what makes Islam different is that Islam believes um, in one God, similar to what I believed at the time. They do have a set rule book, but they also got a, almost like an oral law. So they've got the Quran which means to recite because um, it should never have been written down i'll explain that later on and then they've got the the sunnah the the way the prophet uh, lived um, that was also written down but this was all oral at first they do believe that jesus was a prophet but they do not believe he was a god so for me at the time that was similar to what I believed. Um, but again, there was things about Islam that just didn't make sense to me. And I wasn't really keen to get into something um, very strict 
at the time and I was basically there to party and uh, make good money um, and that was basically my Malaysia trip so that was in 2007 um, I wanted to stay longer in Malaysia because I loved it there I mean I was partying like an animal um, I had girlfriend upon girlfriend uh, living living my best life um, so I actually wrote a, a letter to the South African government because I actually never did my government service um, we call it the Zuma year because at that time Zuma was the president um, so I wrote them a letter said I want to stay another year in Malaysia you know I'm getting great experience in my field I could bring it back to South Africa and aid in its development you know a very nice email basically I wanted to party but that is what I told them um, and they told me that if I did not return to the Republic of South Africa on the 7th of January 2008 they will scrap me from the medical role which basically means that I studied for nothing so in 2008 um, I returned to the Republic of South Africa to Cape Town uh, where I worked uh, for Conorari Hospital which is a, a government hospital um, and it means you basically work 7.30 till 4.30 uh, and you don't really work after that you know proper government setup so at this time also I was sporting like an animal uh, many times showing up at work directly from a club uh, changing in the bathroom and then continuing my daily work uh, after my government service I had an amazing opportunity to work in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia so in Saudi Arabia I worked for uh, Sultan bin Abdulaziz humanitarian city he was the king at the time um, and he established a massive a rehabilitation hospital a thousand four hundred beds um, I was very well paid tax-free being Saudi um, 60 days leave two flight tickets a year it was living it was living the dream but in Saudi um, which is my mush and experience if you want to see how people live in biblical times you need to go to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and spend a weekend or a week with the Bedouins they are still on that vibe um, it was a very interesting experience and it is the place where I learned and growed the most um, out of any place I've ever been so I was in I was in Saudi for three years um, and with me they worked two german brothers uh, makram tebi and sofian tebi now both these brothers were um were secular uh germans they are tunisian descent so they look arab but they uh grew up born in germany only know german they could already speak english when they arrived in saudi they could definitely not speak arabic um they now speak English and Arabic to show you what can be done they were a bit older than me so me and this younger brother Sophie and Tebi we had almost daily religious discussions some would call it arguments but for me and him it was proper debates um, often the whole place would go dead quiet um, and there was about probably 20 people working with us and they would just see us exchanging you know religious ideas he obviously wanted to convert me to Islam because he feels the best religion because he converted to it um, and at that time you know I was still pushing the the uh, Christian uh, theme and the Christian religion but I already knew I wasn't really Christian and that I did believe more like like Jews believe but I didn't at that time yet know that you could actually uh, convert to become a Jew I thought you know 
Jews are just born Jewish, you know, their mother's Jewish, your father's Jewish, then you're Jewish. Um, it's like, uh, it's in your bloodline, it's like being Afrikaans. Um, you know, you look a certain way, you speak a certain way, you're Jewish. Um, I didn't really know anything. Um, and it's also with Sophian and the exchanges we had um, from 2009 till 2011, three years, that we had these exchanges going on, um, that um, I learned a lot about Islam. Um, you know, how Islam came to be, and um, I also learned a lot about the issues within Islam, um, which is maybe a video I will make uh, in another time. Um, but we had fierce debates. In one of these debates, Sofian told me that he actually wanted to convert to Judaism, but and they met rabbis and everything, but it was just too difficult and they didn't want to convert them. So I told him, what do you mean you want to convert to Judaism? And you can't convert, man. You've got to be born a Jew. It's got to be, you know, in your blood. You don't even look Jewish. You don't talk Jewish. How can you be Jewish? I mean, convert Jewish. He told me, look, he knows this to be true because he's, he looked it up and he went through the whole thing and he's uh, very happy, um, alhamdulillah, that he, he didn't become Jewish and that he's now a very devout uh, Muslim. And I can tell you that these two guys, these two brothers, Sofian and Makram, are very devout Muslims. I mean, they, they shave their, their head or cut it mama short very long beards, wear their clothes three quarter, they do everything exactly as it is in the book. If there was Haradim within Islam, they would be Haradim. Um, or Hardal, uh, maybe. Um, but, uh, and I've got the greatest respect for them. Um, I'll, I'll maybe pop a few pictures of, of us, you know, now, like now, in this video. Um, so you can see who I'm talking about. Um, but lovely guys, we still, me and Sofian and Makram, he's still in touch till this day. Um, I've got the most respect for them, um, their way of life, um, their belief, their commitment. Um, and it's also from them that I really learned a lot about Islam and I had ideas about Islam like many of you would have that, you know, Islam, you know, they're just blowing stuff up and screaming Alhamdulillah, uh, which means praise be to God. Um, but that is not really Islam. Uh, like Sofian often told me, you know, if you see the people on the news that blew stuff up, they normally got long hair, they don't have a long beard, they wear very modern clothing, and they don't wear three, three quarter, um, so they are Muslim, but they are not observant Muslims. And you get crazy people everywhere. And the problem with Islam is it's a religion of two billion people. Um, so if 1% is crazy, then you've got uh, two million crazies running around. So that is uh, my view on it. Um, I've got great respect for Muslims, if they're observant, may they go on their way. Um, and I believe strongly, and this is the Jewish belief, that they will have a share in, in the world to come because they observe the seven laws of Noah. So, um, I got a bit off topic there, but that is uh, my take on Islam and just again, um, a uh, big thank you to Sofian for all the discussions we had. It really did shape me um, in my way of belief. Because it was at that time that I consulted with Rav Google. And, um, and I found um, one, uh, one Haredi looking Jew. Um, whose name I will drop down below. And I will also put a link to his channel. Unfortunately, um, I have heard that he has passed away. 
um, and may this video be um, uh, a blessing in his name and may his uh, neshama receive an aliyah uh, he really helped me out a lot and I know that many converts listen to him still just shows the impact that he's still making on so many people's lives um, I wish the best for his family um, and I wish them a long life um, so I really listen to him a lot I also um, at that time li listened to Rabbi Usher a lot a lot of you have asked me do I know this rabbi I do I followed him for quite a while um, and I did in my comments give you my take on Rabbi Usher currently um, at the time when I was listening to him it was still Mamash Haredi you know black and white pious everything um, I believe he's now more modern orthodox so yeah these are the people I was listening to online I was obviously going on Aisha Torah um, the website uh, uh, website I would definitely recommend I was on Chabad.org um, I was on all the sites that you guys are on um, and more and basically at the end um, of um, 2011 I decided after I discovered that you can actually convert to Judaism um, the religion I felt most connected to um, I uh, decided that I do want to convert I actually smuggled um, a few Jewish books into the kingdom now the kingdom actually checks things as they come in um, so that you don't have any pornographic stuff or filthy stuff uh, with you they actually check your computer it's the whole thing um, and I uh, actually put them in, in medical books so I took a medical books cover popped it over the religious book um, and then sent it uh, to the kingdom um, it's easier than taking it yourself because they more they check better when you bring it in yourself now Saudi is a very insular country and it is forbidden to practice any other religion other than Islam within the kingdom of Saudi Arabia in my opinion it's their country they can do with it what they want um, and I anyway <laughs> studied quite a bit of Torah within the kingdom um, so also um, in 2010 um, which I neglected to mention but in 2010 I actually was in South Africa South Africa for quite a while my father had a long battle with uh, also with cancer with um, esophagus cancer your um, the thing that you swallow with those that's, that's medically trained would know esophagus um, and um, unfortunately in 2010 he did lose the battle to cancer um, and he passed away um, was obviously a big impact on me you know I think for anyone's father that, that dies is, is a big thing but you know, me and my father was very close we look the same we speak the same we got similar mannerisms um so it did have a big impact on me um me and my father went for for a lot of long walks um you know in his last month and we chatted about life and and he some of the things he said obviously did have a big impact on me um one of the things he said um was that you know he, he grew up quite poor um come from a poor family um, went to the army his leg got sort of blown up and then reconstructed um, uh, with a border war the apartheid you know there was a war in the north um, on the border where all um, South African men had to serve in the army similar to the IDF um, and that's where he got injured um, but he was still walking far and everything played golf was actually a scratch golfer um, and he had big issues with apartheid um, and the injustice of it and he spoke about that quite a lot uh, um, and yeah, but in these long walks he, he told me you know he built himself up from uh, someone that was pretty poor 
having to work two jobs to get qualified and then working himself up and becoming a doctor in education um, and um, basically re reaching the highest level of his field. He was a scratch golf, as I said. And he told me, you know, now that his time is over, basically, um, you know, he thinks a, a lot of back, back about life. He was quite a workaholic, as I was at that time still, um, which I obviously learned from my father. Um, he said, you know, when he looks back, he wished that he spent less time on work and more time on, on family and, and on religion, on his on his connection with his family and his connection with God, um, which obviously had a big impact on me. Uh, till to this day, I still remember it. Um, and he also told me that, you know, when you, when you die, no one really remembers how hard you work. People say, yeah, I was good at his work. He really built himself up from nothing. Um, but what a lot of people remember is that um, who you were as a person and they will only know that if you spend time with with them and you give them the time of day which is something I'm still struggling with but I'm getting there <coughs> so that was 2010 father passed away 2011 I was uh, still in uh, after my father passed away Saudi was very good to me um, they gave me that month off as a free leave not actual leave um and another month after that so again saudi uh, many people uh don't like the country but they've they are they're very kind-hearted the saudis in general are very good people um and you know i think a lot about it when um um when the commentary speaks about Ishmael, what did Ishmael get from Avram? Is his hospitality. He's good to his guests. Uh, Avram was good to his guests. And I can tell you that Ishmael, the Muslims, are exactly like that. Um, that was 2010. Uh, 2011, I came back. 2011, I was still in Saudi. In 2012, I came back. Um, in 2012, I uh, joined... Uh, um, one of my uh, university friends, we were actually roommates, we studied together. He had a private practice in uh, Port Elizabeth, which is on the, the south coast of South Africa. Um, a very small town, nothing happening there. Um, and I actually came back and I chose PE, um, number one, because I wanted to do my honours. Um, which my field just had at that time and so it me meant I worked uh, three weeks in the practice and then one week I'll be in Pretoria which is a thousand two hundred kilometers to the north and I would fly like this back and forth doing my honors and then uh, working with Christian I was actually also the the CEO of the company I was basically running the company um, in that year but another big reason that I chose PE specifically because I knew it had a, a Orthodox synagogue uh, which I could attend so I almost immediately when I got back I got in touch with uh, Rabbi Bloch which was the rabbi at the time in the PE Hebrew congregation um, a very nice rabbi I mean my very first video you can check that out that was basically talking about Rabbi Bloch, my first encounter with the rabbi. He told me, you're much crazy. You should, why do you want to convert? I told him my reasons that, you know, I believe there's one God and he's, there's no other and he doesn't have friends or anything. Um, and even at that time, my view of God was, was still quite uh, like a child. Um, but I did believe in him and I be believed in the Torah. Um, I had big issues at that time with Kabbalah and the oral law. Now a lot of my issues from Kabbalah was from listening to Rabbi Usher. Um, I actually said in my conversion uh, email, I checked it out before making this video, I actually said I don't want to learn any Kabbalah 
Um, and if they would still accept me for conversion, then great. But if not, well, then I'm not meant to convert. Um, but luckily they looked past that and they did uh, accept me on the program. Sure was my mash orthodox. It was uh, black and white, Haradim, with a two hour Daf Yomi in the morning. Daf Yomi is um, a one page a day of the Talmud, which sounds not a lot, but it is mamash a lot. Um, and davening in the morning, Shacharis. And then in uh, the middle of the day, they literally had it in the middle of the day, Mincha. And then uh, Marif after sunset, and they did it, have it exactly after sunset. So exactly how it's written, they did it, the Haradim. Um, there was actually also a lot of converts in PE. And when I was there, there was nine converts. And a lot of them was Afrikaans which was a rare find, you know, like I told you, Afrikaans people is normally quite insular and stick to themselves and normally Christian and normally don't go off the path. Um, so that was a, a very nice sight to see, but a lot, all of them was older, much older, like 40s, 50s with families, all family converting. Um, so I was there for a year, um, I met the Baidin, um, I met um, Rabbi Endler, who is like in charge of the conversions, um, and he told me in the first meeting, he doesn't know me from anywhere, he told me that you will not finish because you're too young and you live in PE, which is a very small community. There's no A roof, which is um, something that you, that rabbis establish with like poles and strings to make the whole area a private domain. Um, we have an A roof in Cape Town, Baruch Hashem, um, because without an A roof, it is, everything's tricky because you can't carry anything. You can't even carry your keys. Um, very tricky. Stay in a air roof. Um, that would be my advice. Um, so, in exactly as he said it, that is how it happened. So after a year, I felt burned out. I mean, it was just too much for me. You know, basically learning and praying, learning and praying. Um, I couldn't move on Shabbat. You know, with they not being a high roof. So it was just all too much for me and I just wanted to basically get away. Um, and I got another offer um, to work in England, in Manchester, um, in the second biggest rehab facility in the United Kingdom, which was a great opportunity for me. And I personally always wanted to work in Europe and live in Europe and see what it's like. You know, South Africans got this view of um, Europe or even the world outside that it's so much better than us and stuff like that. So that's why I actually wanted to do it. And I wanted to get away from uh, PE and from this very restrictive Orthodox lifestyle that I now found myself into. Um, so in 2013, I was in um, the United Kingdom in Manchester. I attended a no shul. I didn't even go to a shul once. Um, and there is a massive community in Manchester. Mainly Haradim, but still massive. Um, I wasn't there once. I bought it a bit, but nothing like before I found Judaism. So I maybe went out once or twice a week which for me was basically like not going out at all. Um, and I studied quite a lot on my own. So I continued to watch YouTube videos like you're watching now. I watch conversion stories. Um, and I was really struggling to, to know what I should do next. Cause now I know that Judaism is the right religion, but it, I felt at the time, well, I cannot live this lifestyle. It's too restrictive. I mean, I can't do anything. 
Um, so at that time I was 28. This is now in uh, 2013. I did my year in Manchester. I hated England. Um, not the country itself or the weather, like everyone says. The weather was actually quite good. I mean, I love cold weather. Um, it was more the people was a bit sour. Um, and they are my mash insular. They could all become Haradim. Um, they don't really talk a lot to anyone. Um, that's just my perception living in Manchester. It might be now English people watching this saying, nah, it's not true. I mean, you could go into a bus, no one speaks to anyone. Now, South Africans are quite chatty. So, we'll speak with anyone. So, I couldn't really deal with that. And from a career point of view, um, you know, at that time I was 28. I was the manager of the whole place. There was 11 CPOs, prosthetists below me. Um, and England was, is just too far behind South Africa in prosthetics and orthotics. Um, and to try to re-educate everyone and bring them back online to, to the standard that I was used to, you know, being South African and working with Germans in Saudi, I was just, I was going to be too much for me. Um, and like I said, England was not my favorite country. Um, so I returned in 2014, I accepted a, a contract, uh, deliberately a Jew, an Orthodox Jew, Jason Chin, um, that has a private practice in Cape Town. Um, the practice is now called Chin and Partners. You can look it up um, on Facebook if you're on Facebook. If you're not on Facebook, don't be on Facebook. Or on uh, Instagram, or we got a website. Um, I'm also a partner with Chin and Partners um, currently. So I specifically took Jason because he would understand um, where I'm coming from. Because my plan was to again try to convert but I told myself when I left England I'm gonna go back to Cape Town and I'm gonna convert this time but this time I'm gonna take it slow um, and do everything step by step because what happened with me in PE was that everything I learned as soon as I learned it I took it on so the first thing that Rabbi told me is you gotta wear a kippah Poop, got to keep up, put it on, wore it. I ate at KFC, that was my mashat kosher, with a keeper on. I mean, because I didn't know, I thought, you know, chicken is kosher. Um, beef is kosher. It's not like I'm eating piggy or shellfish or something. Um, only later I learned, you know, animals are going to be shechted a certain way. There must be no blood. Um, must be cooked in certain utensils. You can't have meat and milk together. I was eating cheeseburgers with a kippah on. Chilul Hashem, mamash. Um, but I'm sure uh, God would forgive me for that because I, number one, I wasn't Jewish. And uh, I didn't know. I just didn't know. I didn't know all the laws. Um, I knew a lot of Daf Yomi, which I learned in PE. But I didn't know actual practical halakha. In the end of this video, I will uh, probably give you a more step-by-step -step how I think that uh, converts in general should approach it, uh, conversion in general. So in 2014, came to Cape Town, joined Jason, uh, big private practice, was basically running the prosthetics, still am, um, now running the workshop as well, did a bit of the social media stuff that you can check out. Um, so it was so the first year was just practically finding my feet i bought a, a place in belleville which is very far from any jewish community um it's in the african stronghold uh where you need a bucky and uh and uh wood to get in it's a south african joke only south africans will get it um I was still continuing to learn. Um, at that time, I had um, already been to Israel. I was in Israel in 2013, which I sh probably should have mentioned. In 2013, I went to Israel. Um, 
and I basically did like a religious tour so I visited all the Jewish site went to the Wailing Wall um, I bought a kosher, a kosher talit there I bought my tefillin there that's the video that you saw um, and since then I've been wearing a, a talit and tefillin um, with a slight twist that I will say later in this video so 2014 I was I have I have an old school sidur I've got a chumash you know I'm pretty set up but on my own praying every day three times a day on my own no community learning on my own and it is this time that I probably learned the most because it was just me and God that's it me and God um, on this journey and uh, I was heavy into the gym as well um, I was quite skinny as a child skinny as a in university um, so I bulked up a bit from 49 uh, kgs to 65 um, so heavy into gymming and um, big weights and yeah that's now 2014 in 2015 I thought okay right how I must now convert you know it doesn't help you a Jew by yourself many people say you know why can't I just convert myself technically you can't you need three Shomer Shabbat Jews you don't need rabbis but you need three Shomer Shabbat Jews but even if you find these three Shomer Shabbat Jews and they convert you logically you're Jewish according to the Shulchan Aruch but practically speaking no one will accept you you won't be able to get married um, because you to them you're not Jewish um, you won't be counted in a minyan when you go to synagogue number one they will probably not even let you in but if they let you in they won't count you as part of the ten men so if there's nine in you they'll wait for another one um, a lot of social issues with converting yourself through this three Shoma Shabbat Jews I'll make a separate video about this another time um, so at that time 2015 I was struggling I was I was feeling good you know me God doing our thing but I wasn't part of a community and I wanted to get married still want to get married have children you know live uh, a lifestyle that people accept and recognize and people that I can join people that think like me and people that I can discuss Torah with and uh, oral law with um, you know Jews so I thought I'll go I've already had a Haredi experience with PE um, which I mentioned earlier in this video so I'm not gonna repeat it again um, so I thought you know what I'll do I'll go to reform because reform at that time I believed was still 100% kosher um, I'll go to reform reform is at to me at that time it was it's still Judaism it's just a, a more relaxed version that's how I saw it I knew actually from the start that it's not actual Judaism because something that I can remember clearly from my time in PE is Shabbat and Shabbat laws we didn't actually learn from Daf Yomi the page of Talmud today we learned that straight from the Chumash and we learned there that um, you must keep Shabbat it's mentioned 12 times uh, in the Torah and if you don't keep Shabbat you'll be cut from your people that's why in PI I couldn't do anything that's why I was chilling on the couch because I was too afraid to do anything and um, so that left the impression so when I was uh, in reform um, I, I joined the shul I wrote the letter I want to convert I was accepted obviously in reform it's pretty easy um, and they told me it's gonna be a year you gotta pay this much um, you're gonna learn once a week for an hour I thought what a breeze I mean when I was at the other shul I had to learn two hours in the morning some more at night 
And then obviously on, uh, on Sunday we learned also quite a bit. So I thought one hour a day, what an absolute breeze. I asked the rabbi, can I come to shul with my car or should I rather stay home? Because uh, in PE, uh, the rabbi told me, for now you can drive, but you should get a place closer to the synagogue so that you can walk because a Jew can't drive to synagogue. The reform rabbi told me, I drive to shul on Shabbat. So certainly you can. So that always was a thing for me. Also in, the, in my conversion group, there was two guys, two couples, I should say, both with a guy, so two homosexuals, that um, that was converting for marriage, uh, which is strange because it's not really a, it's not allowed in uh, Judaism. It says in the Torah, "Shall not lie with a man; you do with a woman." Um, it's an abomination. It's the sin carries karet, which means you'll be cut off. Similar like a Shabbat, death by stoning. Um, and that I knew from my Christian days. Um, so that was very weird. And it is, it is when that happened, when I saw that and I asked the rabbi about it and he couldn't really give me a clear answer that I, that I told myself, you know, I'm, I'm living a lie now. I'm now becoming a Jewish but it's not really Jewish. It's uh, more secular than Christianity, which is not what I was looking for. It's got the festivals, like I said in my, uh, one of my videos, you know, irreligious Jews uh, or reformed Jews, I think that video was named. Um, it's good if you, there's a lot of similar festivals and stuff, but n not what's actually done in the festival. So I wrote them a letter, I told them, you know, thank you very much, you know, because they are very, there's very nice people in reform. Um, I think I said it in my other video, if I didn't, I apologize, but there's, the people is nice, the, the, nothing wrong with the people, you know, from a, you know, day to day dealing with people, but it's secular. It's more secular than Christianity, like I said, it's a different religion, um, my point of view. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't observe the Torah. It recognizes that the Torah exists, but it keeps nothing inside it. So, I still told today, I don't know how people follow that exactly, the same way I don't know how people follow Christianity. Um, that's just me. Um, so that was my time in reform. In 20, end of 2015, it was November, um, I think it was Tisha B'Av. So now I'm already, I knew that I, reform's not for me. Now it's Tisha B'Av, I've already contacted um, my old rabbi, Rabbi Bloch from PE, my Haredi rabbi, and, and asked him what should I do. I told him um, I was in reform. I can't tell you the stress that created just to tell him that I, I was now in re reform. It was quite a thing. I was stressing about it the whole day. I thought, you know what? He's a rabbi. I'm going to tell him. It's the truth. It's emet. You know, it says God's stamp is emet. It's truth. So I should also speak the truth. So I told him straight up, rabbi. You know, I haven't spoken with him at that time for years. I told him, Rabbi, um, I've been all over since, um, since I started with you in 2012. I am now back in Cape Town. Um, I'm in reform. You, I could feel the silence when I said that. Anyway, he was very nice about it. He said, you know, everyone's got their journey. You don't have to convert. Um, you don't have to be ashamed of it, um, but you know, why am I calling him? So I told him, number one, um, the reason I'm calling is because I do want to realize reform is a different religion, um, and I want to convert Orthodox, but PE was too much for me because it was too much black and white. Um, and I want something in between, and that's what I thought reform is. 
So he told me there is more choices in Cape Town. We've got five synagogues here. Um, probably a bit more. But uh, we've got Chabad. We've got Sephardic. We've got Modern Orthodox. We've got um, the Haradim. We've got Hardal. We've got traditional. We've got everything. Um, not, not obviously being uh, in the diaspora, Galut, it is very much traditional and um, not many people is observant. Not many people keep Shabbat or Kosher. Um, but there is more choice and is an Eruv. Baruch Hashem for the Eruv. Um, but only in Seapoint. Um, so he told me I should get in touch with uh, Rabbi Sam Thurgood. Um, I'll pop his name down below. He's also got a YouTube channel. He's the rabbi that you see in all my um, videos on my Facebook channel, The Jewish Convert. Um, I am still in that shul till today. Um, shul tragically burned down, uh, but I already spoke about that in a previous video, and I'll make a video about that also in future. I'm going to concentrate here on my uh, conversion. This video is already getting quite lengthy. Um, longer than I thought So he told me get in touch with this rabbi very nice rabbi his father also converted um, So chat with him So I sent R rabbi Thurgood an email Just like rabbi Bloch said a very nice guy um, similar age to me um, Father did convert mother born Jewish so he's born Jewish by default uh, so, and he was also not really very observant when he was younger, only later on became religious. This is not Lashon Ara, and he says this openly, um, and it did make it for me easier to deal with him, knowing that, because um, it means he understands the secular, you know, secular life. Um, so, wrote him an email, he said, I can come to shul anytime. The day I chose was Tisha B'Av. So I went to reform for, for the last time, give it a last go, rocked up there, Tisha B'Av. Now Tisha B'Av is, is the remembrance of the destruction of the temples, both temples, one and two. And the reason it was destroyed and everything, it's normally a very somber environment um, and a lengthy service. In the Orthodox world, Eicha, the whole book of Eicha is recited in a very sad tune. Um, there's normally videos shown about the destruction of the temple and how it came to be and why it was destroyed, you know, informative sessions like that. It's basically from Mara, from about 7 till 12 at night, in an Orthodox environment. In the Reform, it was 10 minutes, and I, I'm not joking. We re I went in. And uh, the rabbi said, you know, um, Tisha B'Av is a, a day of sadness. If it is a day of sadness for you, then be sad. If it is not a day of sadness for you and you're happy about the destruction of the temple um, and the abolishment of the temple services, um, then uh, meditate on that. He, and he had some candles and he said, you know, everyone can light a candle and meditate about what this day uh, should mean for them. So I was like, this is my mush, not for me. So I got up, went out, drove to Seapoint, um, came to Seapoint, came in, no one greets me. No one smiles, everyone's sitting on the floor, some crying, while the Book of Eichas recited. You know, this is now... As I walked in, I thought, this is, I'm back in PE. These oaks are serious. Because in uh, Tisha B'Av, people don't greet each other because it says, you, you're mourning the temple now. You can't now, hey, how are you doing? How's your day? Where are you from? That's not done and in the Orthodox world. You observe it as it's written. Um, and the other thing that, that struck me is in Alshul, and I've heard there's various kinds of more modern orthodoxy, so don't get me wrong, um, but 
our show, uh, Bike Midrash Morosha, is sticking to the halakha as it is, as it should be done. Um, with some liberal views here and there, but uh, pretty much as I remember it from PE. People just dress more modern. Um, so I, I started my conversion, I started going to classes, um, I met with the rabbi, like I said, um, I made another video. Um, I think that video's name was Conversion Process Start to Finish. Could be, can't remember all my video names. So you can, you can watch that to learn more about the process of how I converted um, from this point of the video onwards. But basically I met with a gatekeeper um, every four months. I had great difficulty with the rabbis. Great difficulty. Um, number one, I felt that I already did my MPE. And in Cape Town, South Africa, you gotta do two to three years to convert. If it is, or longer, if it's not for marriage. If it's for marriage, it's normally two years. I know it should be the other way around, um, but I have explained that also in another video. So let's now not hammer on that. Um, but I did have issues with um, um, some of the rabbis, how I was handled. Um, most of them was fantastic. They helped me out. Uh, we, I learned a lot. We learned a lot together. Um, there's, so, there's so many rabbis that I don't uh, think I'll have time to mention them all, but um, I'll give a few special mentions um, to Rabbi Thurgood, obviously. He's the rabbi I learned with um, once a week uh, in the mornings for an hour. Um, for that whole, whole year, basically, year and a bit. Um, uh, rabbi Maisels, who's the head uh, kosher rabbi um, that does shechting and everything. Yeah, he's a very nice guy, much older rabbi. Um, always has time for me to chat with me, speaks with me in Afrikaans, even though he's English. Um, which is a sign of respect in Afrikaans culture, um, which he obviously doesn't have to do, he's a rabbi after all. Um, but he always does that, um, Rabbi Suiza, um, both Rabbi Meisels and Suiza was in the Beit Din, uh, Rabbi Kurtstadt, who was the head of the Beit Din, unfortunately his wife got ill, he had to go back to Israel, um, the current uh, Dayan, uh, Dayan Smith, who sat on my Beit Din, it was Dayan Smith, Rabbi Meisels and Rabbi Suiza that eventually converted me, um, but there was also some pretty bad experiences, which I am going to mention, um, because I haven't said who the rabbis were that said these things, um, but I will mention it because I know that there is a lot of converts out there that, that does get treated badly, or things get said to them that upsets them, um, or that they maybe take personally, or that is my mosh personal. Um, and I will, I will say it so that you, you know it does exist, so that you don't go into this, if you're watching this as like a conversion story, um, that you don't go into it blind, and that you don't think, um, oh, the Jewish convert, he had probably such an easy road. I had a long road. I started in, I started in uh, 2012, beginning 2012. I finished um, at the end in... November 2017 um, so I had a long hard journey but the hardest part was the last part remember most of the rabbis are English so it could be that they don't understand the culture or where we come from but Afrikaans boykies we got a thing for our mothers so if you say anything bad about an Afrikaans boykies mother you know he gets heated he, if he has any anger issues, it comes out when you say anything about, it's better not to speak about Afrikaans Boyki's mother. You can ask, how is your mother? I hope she's good. 
that's as much as you should say about Afrikaans guys mother. Um, also, we come from a very, you know, like I said, conservative background. And there is a big thing with homosexuality. We are against it. Um, you know, people, uh, it, we, we're not for it. We don't entertain it. Uh, we don't even entertain jokes about it. Also, if you like tell an Afrikaans guy that he's, he's gay, um, most likely you'll get hit. Um, we are quite passive aggressive. Um, so that's just a bit of a cultural background. Make the, understand the story a bit more. Maybe if, in other cultures it's not a problem at all. Um, so the one rabbi told me um, that, uh, and he told me this with a straight face with another rabbi next to him. He told me that, um, so are you still going to your mother? This was now, um, you know, to check where I'm at. So I told him, yes, Rabbi, I still visit my mother and I take bread with me and kosher cheese and I've got Marmite and um, I take fruit because I, I assumed he's checking my cash root level when I'm at home. You know, I eat out of paper plates, um, assuming this is w what the question is leading to. So he said, um, so um, how do you feel? about your mother being a, a idol worshiper and even according to the seven laws of Noah she will definitely go to hell <laughs> so I uh, did lose my temper another rabbi told me um, that there was another convert before my time I didn't know this convert but there was another convert before my time that was also Afrikaans also very dedicated, also very smart, also very learned, um, and he finished conversion, but they always had doubts about him, if he's gay or not, basically, that's what they're saying. Um, and then he went to Israel, and he jumped out of the closet. Um, and they don't want that um, to happen with me. That's why they're not converting me, even though I know everything, not everything, but I know what I need to know to convert. So I told him, Rabbi, what are you saying? So he told me, you know, we worried that you might be gay. <laughs> so first I laughed, oh, I thought he was joking. I genuinely thought that this rabbi obviously kn knows my culture and, and our things with it. Um, so I told him, Rabbi, are you joking? He says, no, it's, it's a concern and they worried about it. And um, I, I, I didn't even know how to respond. Needless to say, me and that row are still talking after that, but, you know, obviously, um, you don't say that to Afrikaans boyki. It just doesn't, doesn't go down well. So what I also want to say with this is that even though you, you know, people say things to you, or I don't know what culture you are, where you come from, and they mention things, you know, take it on the chin. Uh, there's not much you can do, to be very honest. Um, uh, finish your conversion. You do you. Don't worry what other people has to say. Um, they'll eventually realize that they were wrong, uh, no matter what they said. Whether it's your mother going to burn in hell, or uh, that you could be batting for the other team. Um, People are going to say what they're going to say. You do you. That's what uh, is my firm belief, and that is what has pulled me through, Baruch Hashem. Um, so, in this conversion, I had a lot of that. Um, I was quite a controversial convert because I was very persistent on that the Shulchan Aruch, Yoredaya 268 CF2, should be followed in full as I learned it. And no rabbi could give me a straight answer. I actually did make a video as well that explains why conversion takes so long. And I do speak about this section in the Shulchan Aruch as well. Um, so you can check that video for my answer on that because that's quite a long story. Um, so Baruch Hashem, 
in November 2017, I finally passed the Baidin. Um, that's also in a video that I mentioned earlier that you can check out. Um, I finished. It was... Uh, at that time, I was just glad I was done, to be honest. Many people ask me, how did you feel when you converted? Um, I tell people, I didn't feel really, I didn't really feel anything. I was glad I was done. I was glad I was done with the rabbis, you know, meeting them regularly. Um, and they like, getting on my, on my nerves. Um, I was glad I was done. I was glad that I was now able to do, uh, I was able to do me. And, and not do everything the way that they want it to be done. Um, but more the way that it is written. Um, so that is basically how I felt about my conversion. I, um, I, I did speak about this in the video as well, but they passed that one letter in front of me, um, on my conversion day. And I was, I told them, I don't want to sign it. I don't want to, cause it's, it's a, a form that basically says that they can annul your conversion at any time if you don't keep, uh, the mitzvot. Um, which I was just offended by after five years, uh, to be very honest. Um, but I did sa sign that document, um, and I, under great protest, um, but I did sign it. And I, it's now 2019, I actually did want to wait until I make this video so I could tell you what happens after conversion. Um, so... Baruch Hashem, still observant, still some Shabbat, still some Kasherut. Um, I dated the Israeli girl briefly, that was in Cape Town. Um, I learn about two hours a day. I still go for daily minyan. My Shachris game has never been great. It hasn't improved since my conversion. Um, so I don't always attend the Minyan for Shachris, it's quite early in the morning, 6.40, 6.50 to be exact, you know, depending on the day, Torah reading day is 6.40, non-Torah reading day is 6.50, Rosh Chore is 6.30, um, which is a bit early for me. Um, I went to Yeshiva, which is a video I made that you all know about, um, Aisha Torah accepted me with open arms. I can say also say about the Baidin, um, they keep your form, um, your actual conversion document for a year or nine months, in our case a year, South Africa. But when I told the rabbis I want to go to Yeshiva, they don't give it to you, but they will happily send it to the Yeshiva, so you could go to Yeshiva straight away if you want. Um, they're only keeping that form to make sure you keep the mitzvot. To be honest, and that you didn't deceive them in some way. So that's also some of the things, some of the issues I had. Um, I did learn later on that um, they don't do it to be vindictive or something or to actively go against you. They're doing it because they probably had bad past experience um, and they don't want it to be repeated and they feel right, they're responsible for every convert they make because um, there is a passage like that um, so that's pretty much why they do it so I went to Yeshiva um, I'm now back in Cape Town um, I am actually also in the process of making Aliyah um, I will be uh, I'm moving Hashem, soon to uh, Eretz HaKodesh um, in the not too distant future. I'm just sorting out some stuff, paperwork, got to sell my house, got to sell my business, my shares in my business. Um, and then I'm going to Ulpan for six months at uh, Ulpan Etzion Yerushalayim um, to get my Hebrew game up. Um, I don't think I've ever really made a video about it, and I should probably, my feelings on Israel, and I do have some, uh, I'm not a, a Zionist like uh, many other converts. Um, I, I, I love uh, Israel, the biblical Israel, 
um, but the start um, is not exactly kosher um, so I do have some issues with it um, but I feel that is the place to be the main reason I'm going to Israel is to find a nice Jewish girl settle down get married have 12 children you know the tribe the tribes of Israel uh, maybe not 12 but, but I have a fear um, that's a plan going forward I'll obviously keep on making these videos I've got plenty of other topics that I want to still talk about the channel will probably start to be more about you know currently it's uh, Judaism Malacha conversion I'll probably pop in Israel there as a side note um, but yeah that will all be happening soon um, and that's basically my conversion story from I took you from 1985 to where we are now 2019 I am now 33 years old Baruch Hashem I want to add as a side note I've got zero health problems um, so if you watch the first part of the video I don't really have I don't have asthma anymore um, I had a lot of sinus problems, that's all gone, Baruch Hashem, no heart disease, no cancer, Baruch Hashem, still amputee, uh, that is uh, sort of permanent, um, but uh, everything going well, um, learning is good, I've bought more bo books than I could probably read, um, and happy to see what what the rest of my life has in store for me um, maybe I'll make like yearly updates or whatever I anyway make it in my um, subscription uh, videos but a little bit more maybe in detail um, I hope for you that that is you know just starting or watching this is a very first video definitely watch my earlier videos on um, no, why would you want to convert and that type of stuff? Um, this one was just more personal story, my story. Um, and not really so much related to everyone, but maybe there's something in it that you can connect to. Maybe you're also starting out in your early 20s. I know a lot of the other convert videos, and I watched almost them all, it was normally older people. Um... And it's because younger people don't really make videos. Um, so that's why I always wanted to do it. So that, you know, someone that is watching this channel right now, this video right now, thinking, should I convert? Know that just by the story, you can see it's not an easy journey. Um, it's filled with a lot of twists and turns and it's up and it's down and it's up and it's down. And it's a, a constant um a battle not really constant because after conversion you do feel like you've finished it um and i can tell you the community will welcome you if they see you committed and serious like i've been they'll commit you they'll accept you with open arms um i'll take this time just to also thank a few of the families that have really supported me in a in a big way um, families that I ate with almost every Shabbat, um, every Chagim, um, it's the Katz family, um, the Galps, Leanne and Greg Galp. Uh, Greg is also a musician, magician, makes things appear and disappear. He's also got a, a Facebook page, um, which I will pop maybe down below. Um, the Meltzer family who has been great um, to me as well. Uh, obviously the Thurgoods, my rabbi, and the Rebetzin, Aviva, um, that's also hosted me plenty times. Um, and then also the, the wider community um, that has supported me in, in everything really. Um, the Daily Minyan, people like uh, Matthew Leiby, uh, Alon Saban, um, there's uh, too many to mention, Philip Shear, um, all the other converts, 
Um, there's just a lot of people that has helped me out. I've probably not even mentioned a quarter of them. And I'll pop some uh, names below. Like I said, my memory isn't great. That's just the people that pops in mind right now. Um, so I would like to thank the entire Cape Town uh, Jewish community for all the support, for welcoming me, um, for always, you know, listening to what I have to say. Um, and yeah, just thank you. And for all the people that's watching this video, uh, people that's thinking of converting or people that's already converted, um, I wish you all the best. Uh, on your journey, wherever, wherever this journey might take you, um, it is, even if you take God out of the equation, it is the best way to live your life. Um, and that is, um, even without the greatest benefit of religion, of being connected to God, is that it is just the best moral way to to live your life um, with great family structures um, which many people have noticed in Judaism in general so I wish that you all will continue to be blessed in everything that you do Shavua Tov Hashem Elech Hashem Alach Hashem I